explored a lot of different services in it. There will be no Echo Dots, but I fund this project and a lot of them through my Echo Dots and the skills. So go back to that presentation to learn how to get free credits with AWS. And we're just going to go right into the demo. Never been done before. Um, but this is a website I made over the past month or something. Um, so I call it Glimpse. Say so you get a fishy email in your spam, maybe like ritsec.club. We're going to scan it. And then in a little bit, you get a screenshot. So now you didn't have to visit the website and get the malware. AWS did. Um, <laughs> and you get a little bit of information about it, too. Um, and this is where we're at right now. So how did that work, you might be asking. Well, here's, here it is in little blocky icons. So we started with our website on the left. And that made a web request to API Gateway, which is a service in AWS. And that invoked a serverless Lambda function not really serverless, we'll get into that. Um, and that, that runs my actual Python code, which takes the screenshot using Selenium, uploads the screenshot to S3, and uploads more data to DynamoDB. So we'll go over this in a bit more detail now. First, who am I? I'm Nathaniel Beckstead. You probably know me by now. Uh, I do a lot of cloud stuff, like we've seen. Uh, I've started to look into DevOps more, watched a lot of talks, read a lot of stuff about it. Pretty cool. It's the way of the future. And I spend a lot of my time in the cyber. So this idea kind of came from my internship at KeyBank. I worked in the SOC, and we used the URL scan a lot. Who's used URL scan before? Awesome. You should. It basically does what my project does, but better. Uh, so. Kind of the same interface, too. But um, we won't say that because of legal issues. So you put in domain, and it scans it, and gets out a lot of useful information. So like this site, um, that's really small. You probably can't see a whole lot. But you see the Canadian flag, so it shows you what location the server's in. And down in the bottom left, you'll see all of the IP addresses and domains and ASN countries of what uh, other links are, are um, files it's pulling down. And a lot of other different things. Um, in my resources on the last slide in this PowerPoint, they go into a, a lot of depth about the technologies they use um, for identifying a lot of these things. And one of my favorite features is the HTTP transactions. So for each web request, when you load the page, it logs it, gives you the um, method, the status, what it was getting, uh, and it gives you the hash of the response. So if you have like a background image, say, of like the OneDrive login, and you know what its hash is, you can put that in the URL scan and get back all of the OneDrive phishing uh, domains, which is pretty cool, super useful for threat, threat intel, or if you're running a SOC and you want to get ahead of the reports. So after my internship, I kind of wanted to do something like this just to see how it worked, see if I could do it better. This only runs out of one server in Germany. And I feel like you can do, with technologies these days, you can run a bunch of different apps all over the world. And that's kind of what I want to do is um, give that more option. And it only runs Chromium. I wanted to do more user agents. So I made HTTP info, which it, uh, which is a Docker container that basically runs a script that launches Selenium and takes a screenshot. You can see this whole GitHub repo is a Docker file and a Python script. So the Docker file um, installs Selenium, which we'll talk about is basically like a browser um, driver. And it'll load the web page, take a screenshot, and it uses browser mob proxy, which is a small little jar file, which uh, is the Oh, thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Which will record the uh, HTTP transactions. And then for my web app blog project, I put this into a CSV and also calculated the hashes 
of the responses. So that was pretty cool. I did a lot of stuff with that, but it was in a Docker file, or yeah, in a Docker container, and I kind of want to make this a more public project and have it run in a website rather than a really long Docker command. So first of all, what is this Selenium? You may have heard of it before. Um, it basically emulates a browser. Well, it doesn't emulate it, it runs it. Um, you use the actual Chrome binary and it can interact with your web page. So I gave a talk last semester about automating websites with Python requests. And that's cool, but you can't really run JavaScript or see what the final web page is. You can't click buttons. With Selenium, you can, and you can see it do it in real time. You can use it for testing, which is what it's kind of designed to do, or you can use it for setting up uh, websites. So Nextcloud is a good example. You install a bunch of stuff on your server, but then you have to go to the IP and put in your username and information in the database. And that doesn't really work if you want to automate that. So you can use Selenium to do that. And this screenshot of the code is basically getting all of the links from the anchor tags in that web page, um, which is pretty useful, three lines of code to get all that information. So back to our actual infrastructure, which is what I really love about this project. So the main core of it is Lambda, which is called serverless computing. So really what it is, you only get charged for your execution time and the resources that you use. So whereas you would normally just rent a server, like $5 a month digital ocean droplet, and run your program on that, maybe it gets run 10,000 times, maybe it gets run once, um, you're still paying the same rate. This you only get charged when it runs for, and there's supposed to be quick functions, like five seconds, a couple milliseconds, and it's super cheap because of that. And you can set up triggers for it. So um, this is the AWS IoT button which you could get from writing an Alexa app. We'll just put that echo dot thing in there. Uh, and that'll, you press the button, that's like there's dash buttons, but it runs your code. Um, when a DynamoDB entry gets placed or you upload a file to S3, it can run. I use API Gateway and we'll talk about that, or it can run it as, at a certain time. So actually have a AWS server, like the EC2 server, that I have to run cron jobs, but this would actually be really useful, and I should probably switch over to this, because then you only get charged when it runs, rather than just having a server sitting there running one thing every hour. So like I said, it's really cheap. So it has a free tier, where the first million requests, which is like invoking running the function, are free, and then it has this 400,000 gigabyte seconds of compute res resources are free, which basically means if you set your RAM limit at 512 megabytes, you get 800,000 seconds of runtime. So if my scans take 20 seconds, every month I can run a scan, or I can run 40,000 scans for free, which is pretty good uh, when we're talking about uh, five dollars versus free. So how does this actual Python code run? It loads up Selenium, like I said. Um, basically, you just install the Selenium Python module and you run the Chrome driver for it and it loads up Selenium or Chrome and runs it through that. You just do like a dot get URL and it loads it. Then you do dot screenshot and it saves a screenshot, and then we upload it to S3. And it does the same thing for the DynamoDB information. We're just uploading it to our database. And this uh, 21 buttons Pi Chrome list is really good if you want to do kind of this stuff with, in Lambda. So it gives you kind of a, a base of code and dependencies that you just fork it. My project's just a fork of this, and you can change it to run whatever you want. It has a nice make file to deploy everything. This is what the actual web interface looks like. So this function is called glimpse scan. And you can see that the trigger is API gateway. And it has permission to do all of these different things. It's a really visual editor um, rather than like changing lines in a configuration or something, which is what I really love. 
So how do we actually deploy this? Like I said, PyChromeList comes with a make file, which believe it or not, you can use to automate more than just compiling your C code, which is super awesome. So this target of pack builds your uh, build.zip file basically to upload to Lambda. It gets all your dependencies, um, installs all your pip requirements, and puts it into a zip file so that Lambda can just extract it and run it really fast. And then deploying it, I use the AWS CLI to upload it to S3 and then update the Lambda function code. And so this is all automated. I make a change, run, make, deploy, and it updates it in Lambda. DevOps. All right, so the second part of this is storage. I'm gonna talk about S3 and DynamoDB kind of together because they're pretty much doing the same thing. You're just uploading information. S3, they call it key value storage. It's basically an FTP server. I don't wanna think about it too hard. Um, you're uploading a file and then you can download that file. Um, I use it to host the images because I don't really wanna deal with um, getting that information. You just get a link and it's a publicly accessible link. Speaking of which, I understand now why so many S3 buckets are accidentally public. The, the permissions on them are really hard. Uh, there's a lot of complicated words and permissions that it sounds right, but it's probably doing something totally different. Um, so yeah, I've messed up permissions a lot just trying to make it public. And then we use the Bodo library through Python, which is their, um, their library for all of AWS, ba basically. Um, so this line just makes a connection to S3, establishes that key is the file name, basically the path that you wanna upload to, and we upload it from a file, and that's all. We're not um, making API requests to AWS at all. It's all through the Bodo library. S3 is insanely cheap. So for storage, your first 50 terabytes are two and a half cents per gigabyte, and I'm storing images, when, which aren't super small, but they aren't super large either. And then you're also, you're also storage for downloading and uploading, so that's like 0.2 cents per gigabyte that you upload, and 0.5 cents per 1,000 gets, basically, or puts. Um, for uploading. And then getting down, getting information's even cheaper. That's like, what, seven ten thousandths of a dollar for, per gigabyte of downloading, and what, four ten thousandths for 1,000 requests. It's super cheap, basically free. Um, they, they price these models around big companies that'll have like millions or billions of requests. So for a little project that might get, um, we'll, we'll be generous and say 10 more people than me use it every month. Um, it's gonna be not even pennies. DynamoDB is a NoSQL database, which basically means you don't have to go through normalizing. Um, I hated the database class and all that fifth normal form and things. Yeah, Scott knows what's up. Um, with NoSQL and DynamoDB, you basically say, give it a table name, give it a key you wanna search by, upload whatever you want in whatever form, and we'll, we'll handle it for you. And since it's hosted on AWS, it's all through the web console. You don't have to install your servers or update them or figure out configuration information. Um, you click a button, put in your table name, and you have a new table. And as well, through the Bodo library, you aren't putting in IP addresses or login information. You're just saying, here's a database, put some information in it. And with Python, it's super nice. You just have a dictionary, and you upload that dictionary, and it figures out the types for you. So it's literally two lines of code to upload some information. This is also pretty cheap. This goes by million reads and writes. 
Um, the numbers aren't as small, but it's still basically free. They have a free tier, which is free forever. It's not like the 12 months free. This is free forever, 25 gigs of storage, two and a half million reads, and one gig of transfer out, or yeah, just downloading. All right, so API Gateway. I love this because I've written all of my APIs in Flask so far, and it's cool, you can do a lot, but it gets complicated, and it gets really messy. So this gives you a nice editor. You can see all of your endpoints in one thing. You can see all your methods in that same column, and it gives you a section just to document in it, and you can publish that documentation um, with it. So it's all in one place, super easy, super nice. And this is just converting between our web request that we make through the website and then giving input to Lambda, basically. Um, yeah, and the cool thing I learned is you can make a totally functional API by just using a API gateway, making requests to DynamoDB, no code whatsoever. It's super cool, super free. And I highly recommend you try it out. Um, even just like get some information, upload it, download it, and you'll see how easy it is. And you'll probably learn a lot through it. This is what the editor looks like. So on the left, we have our client, they call it, which is making a request to API Gateway. And the top left is the method request where we handle HTTP parameters. Um, so you'll see query string is URL, so I'm just handing it a URL, and then we just pipe that into our Lambda function on the right. It spits out some information, convert it to HTTP, and you can handle kind of error requests and things, and put it back to the client. And the conversion's a little funky. They have mapping templates. I don't even know a whole lot about them, but for simple input output, you're probably gonna be fine. This is the most expensive part of this API, and it's $3.50 per million API calls. Um, and if you wanna do caching, you don't have to. That's super expensive, that's $15 a month. That's like a little bit more than a Netflix subscription. And um, I'm not about caching, we'll just stick to 350. I get like 10 API calls a month, so we're fine. Um, yeah. That's super expensive. And finally, we have our website, our beautiful, pretty website that is probably pretty bad. I, don't know. I hate CSS. Uh, but I use GitHub pages for this. This is the only not AWS thing, um, just because I didn't want to deal with S3. Um, more website stuff, you can like make a static site with S3 but I like GitHub pages and it goes to my URL automatically. So that's cool. To start a website, all you have to do is make a new repo, add an index.html, go to your repo settings, choose GitHub pages, and it automatically builds it, and you have a website, which is super cool. Finally, I love this quote. It's from 2011, and the account is basically dead, but it's a gold mine if you love kind of DevOps stuff and infrastructure things. This is a great quote, probably my favorite quote of all time. So why use this? It's super easy. Like I said, you literally click a button, put in a table name, put in a primary key, and you have a new database that you can upload and download information from. On the right is API Gateway. You can see all of your requests and methods all in one column. And you can click on each of those to see more information. Um, and finally, Lambda functions on the bottom. You just put in a name, put in I want to run Python code, and upload your Python code. Or if you don't need any dependencies besides normal Python, and it's below like 500 lines of code, you can edit it in AWS console. It has built logging built into it. So without any setup or anything, you get logs and dashboards. So on the right is Lambda stuff about how much it, how long it runs and if it errors out or not. On the left is 
database stuff about their latency. And as I've been saying this entire time, it's super cheap. Here's my bill. I think this is, I don't even know what the 350 is coming from. Probably some other project. Um, and then on the right, it shows you all your free tier usage. And so the most, uh, the largest percent of free tier I have is 0.42%. And this is the entire month of March as of two days ago, I think. All of these projects have been like 0.13% for Lambda, 0.01% for CloudWatch logs, and everything <coughs> below that is uh, less than, can't even compute it, 0%. Uh, and I, I've been using this a lot. Like I've been testing and running a lot of queries, and it's still at basically 0%. So it's free. It's basically free. <laughs> Newman. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've said before, I get $100 a month, so I don't even look at my billing most times until it reaches like $80 a month. Um, so, yeah. All of my projects and stuff, I just spin up a new EC2 box. Easy. Done. Uh, it's good to be rich. <laughs> So some new, con new um, things I've been working on, continuous integration. So I've been, all this week, I've been working on getting Travis to work. Um, I've actually been not committing to the master branch this week, which is pretty great. I actually have a build branch. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, that's been a pain, uh, <laughs> trying to get that to work. Um, but it's been fun. Uh, so. I have this whole pipeline now basically working where I make a commit, push it to GitHub, it, it tests it in a Docker container. So there's a Lambda Docker container which emulates the environment. And so you can test that locally without being charged. And then that does, works through Travis, and then it uploads it to my test Lambda function, tests all the AWS infrastructure, and if that works, pushes it to production, which is pretty cool. I also love the network activity stuff on URL scans. That's what I've been working on a lot. Cool little tip I learned. If you open up your browser console and do window.performance.getentries as a function, you get all of the URLs that have been called by loading that page. So you don't have to set up any proxies or anything. You can just see the URLs right there just through JavaScript. The browser um, saves that for performance statistics, I guess. So that's probably how I'll start network logging. Um, and like I said before, I really want to do multiple regions and browsers. So right now, I'm still using Chromium just in the US East uh, area. But it'd be super easy to move this to, I don't know, five locations around the world and have it um, be able to choose which one you want to run. And a whole lot more. I have a huge to-do list. I come up with ideas every hour, it seems. Um, if this sounds interesting, I'd love to get some help on it. It's quickly becoming a large project. And finals, and I actually have work to do now. Um, should, well, I've had work to do. It's just the due dates are coming up now. Um, so yeah, I'd love to get some help on it if this interests you. Any questions? Sam. So it doesn't do it for you. To be honest, I haven't looked at it too much. I've just seen the button. Um, actually, I'm logged in now. If we go. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. But I don't think it does it automatically. Um, maybe some stuff, like parameters, it can build you like a little paragraph or something. Um, but I think most of that's manual. 
No, so this is um, your own, yeah, so this is your own custom API for like, I have this slash scan endpoint on some random domain it gives me, and you can put information in that, and then, here, I'll show you. So for this get scan, uh, you can define all your parameters, and it does all the API stuff behind it for calling your infrastructure. Does that answer your question? Cool. Sam. I have, and one of the to-do lists is to go through that again, because I've uh, narrowed some stuff down, but then it wasn't working, so I was trying to increase control over some things. Um, but yeah, I really like the IM stuff, uh, identity and access management uh, panel. Um, you can, everything has an execution role, like each of those Lambda um, functions has a role that it executes as. That was that, um, This. this shows all of the kind of permissions it has on the right there. So it can push to CloudWatch, uh, get entries through DynamoDB, and push to eight, or S3. Um, yeah. So these don't use auth tokens, per se. They have roles. Um, you don't have to put in your auth tokens anywhere. So it has a, its own user, and that Lambda environment has its t tokens built into it. Um, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, it's all public. Go ahead and brute force or like do like 10,000 scans. And yeah, it's all public. We good? Any questions? Cool. Thank you.